going to start with our presentation, guys. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, in Spanish just for the first two slides to explain why uh, the title is in Spanish. And, and basically, that's it. Este es el, el nombre del proyecto de investigación que sometimos el doctor Stuart y un servidor en el año 2019 y el cual fue aprobado en ese mismo año. Lo sometimos en, por ahí por abril y fue aprobado en noviembre del, del 2019. Y el nombre es Errores Sintácticos y Semánticos en la Escritura Académica de Aprendices de Habla Hispana. Lo cual, obviamente, al leer la, al leer la literatura, al tener eh, conversaciones, diálogos, discusiones con algunos doctores expertos en el área, eh, este título lo quisimos cambiar, pero no fue posible porque así fue registrado, así fue aceptado desde el inicio. Eh, eh, al, en este año, al inicio de este año, para el, análisis, para el análisis que estuvimos haciendo de los resultados que obtuvimos, eh, se nos unió la doctora Silvia Rodríguez Narciso. Ella, ella trabaja en el Departamento de Estadística de la Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes. Y bueno, gracias a ello pudimos eh, concluir con el análisis estadístico de nuestros resultados. Next slide, please. The four objectives that we established from the beginning in this project, uh, we, we basically have fulfill the first three and this round of uh, last presentations that we're doing with teachers and students in the different semesters is because we're following the we're trying to uh, accomplish the last objective which is basically to present results in meetings or in workshops and so we had a meeting dr benjamin and i we had a meeting yesterday and we were discussing this, uh, so we're going to have a little bit of uh, mini workshop with you guys at the end of the presentation. One of the yes, uh, one of the other objectives for this, right? And when you're doing research, you're always looking for a problem to to research to better understand and and try to find answers towards. And one of our main objectives was to address the writing uh, problem or the writing challenge students have since writing is the most difficult skill uh, for any english language learner our purpose was to find uh, some some insights some information about our own learners so that we could as teachers in the ba work together and find better ways to help learners throughout the BA with regard to the writing skill. So this was really our main focus as well, mentioning the objective of the study was really to inform the BA teachers so that we could find better ways in providing feedback and assisting the writing process since you're going to be asked to uh, complete different writing assignments uh, throughout the BA. So here we have uh, the writing development, our study really looks at two different areas. One, the writing development being accuracy, complexity, and fluency. We'll talk about those here in a, in a couple of minutes in greater detail. And with regard to accuracy, we're looking specifically at different types of writing errors. Syntactical, morphological, and lexical. We'll talk about those and see some examples of those as well. So when you're doing research, it's always good to see what other researchers have done uh, in the field, right? So we looked and read uh, a lot of articles, and a lot of researchers have looked at defining syntactic and semantic errors, two different types of errors, and they looked at comparing those with other cultures. So there were a lot of research that has been conducted looking at these two types of errors from English language learners from various parts of the world. There were also a, another group of studies that had a different approach where they looked at breaking down the types of errors, accuracy errors, into syntactic, morphological, and lexical. In this example, then, 
semantics is more of an overarching general idea. That is, syntactic, morphological, and lexical all have to do in some way with semantics. And so the more current lit literature and um, uh, for us, the better option was to, to take uh, all the types of errors and classify them as syntactical, morphological, and lexical errors. So for the purposes of our study, we're looking at defining an error as uh, the use of a linguistic item in a way which a fluent or native speaker of the language regards as showing faulty or incomplete learning. This is really related to standard, the standard use of the language. We're not looking at differentiating between errors and mistakes, which in some um, books they make a, a distinction for us. It's just uh, anything, any type of linguistic item that is not standard, we are classifying it as, as an error. So looking at the different types of errors that we mentioned, okay? So the first being syntactic. Syntactic errors deal with word order and errors resulting from the absence of some uh, constituent. So a missing word, for example, if you have a missing word in a sentence, that's going to be labeled as a syntactic error. A sentence fragment, maybe you have talked with your grammar instructor about sentence fragments, mainly missing either a subject or a verb within a particular clause. That would be a sentence fragment. That would be an example of a syntactic error. Also, errors in combining sentences. So... This has to do more with punctuation, a run-on sentence where we have maybe a missing punctuation. We have two sentences that are joined with no punctuation or a connector. This would be an example of a syntactic error. Also, problems with comma splices. If you're using a comma to separate, for example, two main clauses, uh, this is an, an, a, another example of a syntactic error. Morphological errors deal with nominal morphology, which deals with plurals, problems with number and agreement, uncountable nouns and compounds. These are examples of morphological errors. We have also morphological errors that deal with verbs. So we have verb tense, problems with verb tense, subject verb agreement, and the passive formation. These are examples of morphological errors, as well as problems with determiners, articles, and errors with prepositions, okay? These are all examples of morphological types of errors. And notice, this is not what we think this is. This is coming from the literature uh, from other research that have conducted similar studies. Finally, we have lexical errors. And uh, for the purposes of our study, we're dividing these up primarily into two areas. So we have lexical idiomatic, this has to deal with word choice, and then vocabulary errors deal with word form. All right, so um, when we have uh, problems with word choice, these are problems with using the wrong word, but it doesn't interfere with the meaning of the message, so they're less severe. Someone is still able to understand the meaning of the text, although maybe the word is awkward. Whereas we have the wrong word, a vocabulary error then is more serious in the sense that the word that's being used actually interferes with the meaning. So when you read the text, the reader is uh, more likely not to understand the meaning of the message of, of the text. So we have accuracy, the three types of uh, errors that we talked about, syntactics, uh, morphological, and lexical, these are all part of different types of accuracy. It all relates to accuracy. So accuracy is the ability to be free from errors while using language to communicate in either written or speech. We wanted to expand, though, our study and not only focus on accuracy, but also complexity. A lot of the research only mentions and only focuses uh, on accuracy. But we wanted to provide more context and a better understanding of not only uh, the 
the accuracy of the text, but also the complexity. So complexity uh, says here, the development of grammatical complexity is progressively more elaborate language and of greater variety and syntactical patterns or pattering. So you, uh, when you are practicing your writing and you're dealing with clauses, for example, you have main clauses, you have uh, dependent clauses, you have subordinating clauses, you have relative clauses, you have noun clauses. Any type of discussion of different types of clauses deal with complexity, right? So if everyone is just writing very simple sentences, right, with one clause, that's typically less complex than a complex sentence or even a compound complex sentence where uh, relative clauses are being used, subordinating clauses are being used as, as examples. Okay, that's a, a, that shows complexity when you're able to use those types of, um, of those clauses, right? Because they're uh, usually functioning as adjectives and, and adverbs within the sentence. Okay, so this is why we're helping learners develop those types of clauses because we want to also promote complexity. We also wanted to look at fluency, and fluency simply is the number of words that are written over a given period of time. So that also influences complexity and accuracy, right? So it, it's trying to combine these three aspects, accuracy, complexity, and fluency together so that we have a better understanding of the text and how to evaluate and how to help students develop these three aspects of their writing development. So when you're doing research, and for our purposes, we had to come up with a unit of analysis. We are conducting, uh, we conducted a, a quantitative study. Quantitative study deals with numbers, statistics, and in order to do that, you need to be able to measure something. You need to be able to observe and measure uh, the, the, uh, the text that you're dealing with. So for our purposes, for our research, we're dealing with T units. This is how we're going to measure the text for our analysis. And T units have been around for a long time. To understand what a T unit is, we need to understand a clause. And, and I mentioned some examples earlier. We have independent and dependent clauses. As dependent clauses, we have relative clauses, subordinating clauses, and, and nominative or noun clauses or embedded sentences. Now, these, again, are an, an indicator of complexity. And for defining a T unit, then we can do so by saying that a T unit is a main clause with any dependent clauses, whether they're subordinating clauses, relative clauses, or noun clauses, right? So a T unit is one main clause with any dependent clauses attached to that main clause. So as some examples to give you an idea about these different types of how we count T units, a simple, uh, simple sentence that you're familiar with, right? This will be counted as one T unit. This is how we would uh, label this type of sentence. A compound sentence would be counted as two T units. A complex sentence, remember a complex sentence is one main clause and at least one, and one dependent clause. This would be counted as one T unit. A complex sentence would be counted as one T unit. And a compound complex sentence that is two main clauses and one dependent clause would be counted as two T units. Now the study. Okay, so our the research question that we <clears throat> consider for this study is the following. What are the salient syntactic, morpholo morphological, and lexical errors? encountered by second semester students of a BA in ELT in composition writing. <clears throat> so the method that we follow, that we use was uh, for our participants, we 
we recruited 31 learners from a Bachelor, bachelor of Arts in English Language Teaching, uh, 12 males and 19 females. The level of English proficiency according to the <clears throat> semester that they were studying uh, and according to the curricula that is that, that, that establishes a B1 to B2 level according to the framework reference, the European framework of reference. In the age, we have a mean of 20.75 years, which is a range of 19 to 25 years. Now, it's important to mention also the participants that, uh, that, uh, that were part of our study. Some had taken PROPE, which you guys are taking this, this first year. Others came directly entered into the first semester. So there's a mix of some students, most of the students having taken PROPE, and a few students that uh, did not. So the instruments and procedures that we and procedures that we follow, uh, we basically uh, we ask our our participants to write an essay on the topic friendship. For this, we show them a picture of two persons who were hugging each other, and we ask the learners to write uh, about this topic. We gave them 50 minutes to write it. Obviously, they were supervised by uh, by us, by Dr. Stewart, and by myself. And we also asked them to complete an online questionnaire, this with the purpose to get some uh, demographic information and to profile their linguistic profiles. Again, the essays, once we, they wrote the essays, we analyzed the essays uh, regarding accuracy, complexity, and fluency, errors that pertain to punctuation or spelling, with the exception of comma splice errors and run-on errors, were ignored. So this means that we didn't take into consideration capitalization, uh, and, and the use of uh, and the use of punctuation for many uh, punctuation signals, right? Just for the comma when it involved comma splice errors, and and when there was no punctuation, as we know that as run on errors. So here we have a list of the types of errors. Uh, when you're doing research, we have to identify the types of um, the, uh, the concepts, in our case, uh, written errors, and define these for the purposes of our study. So here we have a list of the types of errors along with their definitions. So now errors with nouns, pronouns, and verbs, prepositions, word order, agreement, and so on. Now here we have a list of written errors that were committed by some of the participants. You'll notice here we have some blank columns and um, this was for kind of adapting our presentation for, for you guys. At the end of our presentation, we want to allow some time for, for us to kind of reflect and see if we can identify certain errors. We're going to actually see some examples of uh, the errors that were committed by these students. But you see here some examples of morphological errors that were part of our study. Most of the errors that we've identified were predetermined based on the literature, based on our own experience teaching different writing classes throughout the BA. But some of these were uh, emerged from the process of collecting the data. The example being WF for word form. You'll notice that there are several variations of word form that we considered. And uh, the, these, uh, these types, these very uh, distinct types of word form errors emerged as we were collecting the data. And as we were collecting, we began to categorize these. But most of the other errors were predetermined based on the literature. Here we have syntactic errors. The first were morph uh, morphological, should I say. And then we have syntactic 
errors. We have word order, missing word, run on sentence, comma splice, and sentence fragments. And we also have lexical types of errors. Basically, two categories or two types of errors fall under this category. Wrong word and word choice. Again, the difference being the severity or how it impacts the overall meaning. The wrong word is more severe. It interferes with the meaning, whereas word choice does not interfere with the meaning of the text. So here you can see on this slide an example of a, an essay that one of the participants wrote. Uh, I know this is not very clear. This is just a, uh, a scanned copy of that of, of that essay. And this essay is not complete either because this is this participant wrote two pages. So we're just showing uh, one page. Uh, in the following slide, you can see uh, what we did with it. This is what we did with the 31 essays that we that we collected. And first, what we did was to number the lines. So it will be easier for us as researchers to uh, identify types of errors and agree whether this type of error was either uh, a morphological, syntactic, or lexical error. And then we did the analysis for accuracy. And then we also did the analysis for a complexity and fluency. I know this is not very clear, but in the following slide, you can see an example of, uh, of what we did regarding the accuracy analysis. In this one, for example, this is just one, this is paragraph four from, from that essay. And for, right from the beginning, we, we detected one, one a morphological error, which is subject verb agreement. That's the code that you see there for, for this type of error, subject verb agreement. And basically we underlined the error and then on top of it, we wrote the type of error. Obviously we didn't, we didn't correct this, right? But the right form for this would be supporting because support cannot act as the subject of a, the sentence, right, or, or the adjective of the noun in this subject, right, to point. So that will be, actually there are two errors there. Uh, one is supporting and the other one is helps. So we only marked that as one error, but actually there are two. Another example in the second line, you can see again the word support. So again, we have a problem there with this form of the word. Uh, one more example is you see a little line between to and friend. That means that's a, that means that there's a missing word, and the word that is missing is an article. So this is just an example of how we proceeded to identify the errors, to code the errors, and then we compared we compare our answers, well, our corrections to see whether uh, we have more or less the same type of errors that we identified. And after that, we proceeded with the complexity analysis. So in the following slide, we have, first, what you can see here is that the very first thing that we did was to uh, identify the T units, right? Uh, Dr. Stewart already explained that a T unit is, can be a simple sentence. Uh, in a compound sentence, we have t, two T units. In a complex sentence, we have one T unit. And in a compound complex sentence, we have two T units. In the following slide, what we did was to identify the the clauses in each T unit. And then in the following slide, we just put, we're, we're showing you all of these together. So you can see how many clauses are in each T unit and, and how many T units we found in each line. Next. <clears throat> so 
After we came together and decided and agreed upon the errors, we found in total 901 errors. Now you'll see here on the list, the frequency list, from the most frequent errors to the least frequent, we have the name of the of the error and in parentheses an abbreviation to indicate uh, S for syntactic, M for morphological, and L for lexical error. We have the frequency and the percentage of the total errors for each of these. So you'll notice here we have uh, quite a few different types of errors being included, but this shows you the frequency of those of those errors. Looking at now just syntactic errors, syntactic errors total 222 or 25% of the total errors. So this was a significant um, part of the types of errors that were being committed. You'll notice in this chart, primarily comma splices and missing words take up the majority of the syntactic errors that were committed by learners. But you also see a good portion of sentence fragments, word order, and run-on sentences also being included in these types of errors. Morphological errors made up 399 of the total errors, <clears throat> or 44%. This was the largest uh, percentage here of, uh, of the errors, and uh, we've got a pretty good mix of uh, word form, verb tense, article, preposition, and agreement. You'll notice in each of these categories, there's the frequency along with the percentage. This percentage is the total percentage or the percentage of total morphological errors, not the total, not the percentage of the total errors. Um, so again, this is a pretty good uh, indication of the types of errors per uh, for this type of error, morphological errors. Now we have lexical errors totaling 251 or 28% of the total errors. Again, our two categories are word choice and wrong word. Pretty much more or less evenly distributed, slightly more word choice errors than wrong word errors. Now the T-unit analysis, um, for uh, another way to look at accuracy is simply the percentage of uh, sentences were correct. So here we have basically 0.87 uh, errors or sentences were correct in developing and writing their sentences, right? So this is an indication of accuracy. We have complexity of 1.57. Uh, which means one and a half, more or less one and a half clause, uh, types of clauses per sentence were uh, included. And fluency, 11, almost 12 words per T unit were included here, uh, were uh, observed in the study. All right, so here we've got a few more minutes left. We wanted to leave enough time to give you some exposure to actual errors that were committed in the study. So the list that you have here, these are coming from the actual uh, data collection, the actual essays that students wrote. And in this column, there are some, some mistakes. So we'd like to give you some time here. If you look at this first type of error, See if you can identify the error, if you can maybe type it into the chat box. And let me see if I can open up, because I can't see the chat right now. So if I can up here on one screen. All right, so I can see the chat now. So uh, see if you can, this first sentence, starting with Guadalupe, if you can write out the sentence, identify the error, or correct the error, and then what type of error do you think this error is? What do you think? Feel free to type it into the uh, chat. It is a morphology It's the word order. Because something has to be in the first... <laughs> No, it was syntactic. Syntactic, sorry, sorry, syntactic. All right, so so 
Monse already corrected this, uh, identified this error and wrote this the correct sentence. So the error is the word get, and it should be get. So this, what kind of error is this, Monse? This is a morphologic, it's a morphological error, but specifically what kind of error? Well, I don't know how to explain it, but I knew that get, like the verb, had to be like with an S at the end because it's uh, a singular person. And right. that's why the verb needs All right, S. so we're, we're going to help you with this one and one or two more. So this is a subject verb agreement error. And this belongs to the group of morphological errors. Very good. What about the second one? Can somebody identify where the error is and then correct that sentence? That one is more difficult, right? I don't think. Yeah, this one. I've done exercises in grammar class or in writing class about this type of error. But this is very common for uh, this, are, this is a very common error for our ELT learners in in all the semesters. What do well, you think, Dr. Dr. Stewart? Well, the only thing I would add, this one here, um, it's actually hard to look at it to know the error without looking at the sentences that come before it. And we had uh -huh. the the uh, we had the advantage of reading the text leading up to this. So. The text so was Daniel written. Monse gave us the, just gave us the yeah. answer. Right. So that's the thing. This was written in the past tense because by itself, if you just look at this, you could say at the end of the class, I take my things. If it's a routine, if it's something that you're saying happens all of the time, but that wasn't the case or the usage in this particular example. And again, that's difficult to see by itself, but so yes. What, what kind of error is this? Do you recall? It's like the tense of the verb. Tense, verb tense, very good. The next one. Can somebody identify the error in sentence three? Dr. Stewart, can you write numbers for the sentences so we won't get confused? Yeah, let so me. The error is change. It should be in in what form, Adam Israel? Uh, in... What's the name of this verb? Of the structure of this verb? Uh, is the um... Past, past perfect tense. The name of the structure of the verb is um, past uh, participle. Participle, yeah. The tense is past perfect. Very good. So here again, we're talking about tenses, right? This is a verb tense error. Sentence number four. Somebody, number four, identify the error and write the correct sentence. Thank you, Tania Guadalupe. So what kind of error is this? Morphological, morphological. Eh? It is not morphological, teacher. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. Yes, it is morphological. Actually, all of these examples are morphological, but specifically, do you remember what type of error this would be in this example for number four? For example, here uh, it is used uh, the comparative adjective, but it should be the superlative adjective. <laughs> right. Yep, yeah, that's a word form comparison 
error. Oh, let me check. Or technically yep. a superlative. It, it, they right. use the so comparative, more, right? But yeah, it's, it's a mistake. Yeah. Very good. Number five. Susana Cecilia wrote it. The teacher explained better than you. So this is the other type of comparison. So this is word form comparative error. All right, good. Number six. Number six is very, very common. Very, very common. And we talked about this in our grammar class. We actually spend some time, well, your grammar teacher spends some time <laughs> explaining this and why this is a very common error. So instead of saying the parents of Vero, well, that's Vero's, Vero, Vero's parent, and specifically, what kind, of, what kind of error is this one? I don't know how to say it, but is the one that uh, instead the parents of Vero, we have to use the huh, apostrophe? The apostrophe yes, yes which, uh -huh. is, which means what? Uh, how do we call a noun with an apostrophe S? What kind of noun is that? Possessive noun. A possessive noun. Possessive so this noun. Is, this is a noun error, right? Because in English, what happens, Dr. Stewart, if somebody says the parents of Vero? What happens? Yeah. Do you understand that? Does a native speaker understand that? I think it's understood, but it would be like awkward. Awkward. It would Is be... it possible that a native mm -hmm. speaker would say something like that? No. No. Ne never. Well, I've never heard it uh, used. No. What about small children? It, um, I, I, I. The parents of it. I haven't yet. I've never heard even small children use that. Okay, only 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 English learners, right? Well, I mean, probably. I mean, I've I've but I've never heard uh, growing up. I've never heard anyone use the parents of Vero. Okay. Number seven. <laughs> Yeah, number seven is this is uh, a structure that uh, we didn't study all these type of words, but we studied like four or five, I think. Can somebody spot the error in number seven and write the correct sentence? Estamos probando sus conocimientos de gramática, jóvenes y jóvenes. These types of uh, mistakes occur a lot on the TOEFL exam, on the grammar part of the TOEFL, where yeah. you're, um, yeah. Thank you, Adam Israel. You're welcome. So this is an adverb type of error, right? Completely instead of complete. Very good. Number eight. Number eight is a little bit challenging. And that one, for example, whom is not. This is this is one of the structures that we didn't study in our grammar class. Because we, whom is is used for object. It's like a, exactly. Very good. So instead of whom is who, right? Yeah. And what kind of error is this? Is it an adjective, an adverb, an, an article, a preposition error? Um, what part of speech is, is it? 
it's all related. Um, I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> Relative any... pronoun. That's it. Okay. It is very good. It is a pronoun error because in relative clauses, we can have uh, the relative pronoun who as the subject in relative clauses, and we can also have uh, whom as the object in relative clauses. This is the structure that we didn't explain in grammar. I told you guys that this is structure. You were going to study this in your second course. Right. Number nine. Teacher, are you ready? Um, write something. So what kind of what kind of error is this one? I'm not sure, but I wrote these are two friends who works hard. I don't know if it's also the verb. Uh, we are in number nine now, Monse. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the error is in travel. Instead of uh, the simple form of the infinitive form of the verb, it should be in the true infinitive form to travel. So that's the type of error. we. We coded this error in our study as gerund infinitive error, right? So this is also very common for uh, Mexican English learners, right? When to use a two infinitive form of the verb, when to use a infinitive form, and when to use the ing form. We studied this topic and I told you guys that this topic is more related to vocabulary than to grammar because there are no grammar rules here. So this is basically uh, item learning. It's aprendizaje de vocabulario, right? Very good. Number 10. Monse, Monse wrote when to separated ways. Uh, you haven't identified the error, Monse. Daira Yarazzi wrote the same. So, Daira, you haven't identified the error. Adam Israel wrote the same with a question mark at the end. So, you haven't identified the error either. Any more responses for this one? For number 10? Yes, teacher, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> there are 39 heads thinking about the same thing, right? Oh my God. <clears throat> this is also a very common <laughs> error for, uh, well, Mexican learners, just talking about Mexican learners uh, of English. Uh, they, when they're writing or when they're speaking, uh, sometimes they're using words that uh, they exist in their language, but the structure of those words is not the same in English, right? The brain does that. The brain, the brain tends to generalize, right? Uh, but that's yeah. Are you ready? Uh, put something. So which one? Which one is the error? It's uh, it's missing for the word by. Think of think of this example as word form. There's a problem in this example related to word form. So one of the words in this sentence, the form of the word, like the prior examples, is incorrect. Which word it has a problem with word form or word formation? Yeah, Tania Guadalupe, there's nothing missing here because this sentence is not in passive voice. And we use the preposition by in passive voice structures, but not in this one. This, not, this is not passive voice. This is simple past. It's active. It's an active, active voice. voice. Which word has a problem with word form? Okay. The problem, so how would you fix it? One word. The spelling That's of it. one word. That's it. 
Andrea has it. Yeah. Monse wrote separate, Adam Israel said, yep. You see, we we tend to say separated because that's how we say it in Spanish, right? But separated, well, we have the a native speaker here, not to restore. Does separated exist in English? Does it exist in, in English, the word separated? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Sure. It does? Yeah. But in this case, not in this case, you would say, like, if you go to a hotel, um, you would ask maybe for separate rooms, right? If you want two different rooms, uh -huh. right? So in this use, right, uh, you want to use separate, right, for, for a, as an adjective. But you could also use it, um, they're separated. Let's say, you know, you could say a couple who are married are separated. In that case, you would use separated. But usually when it's what's called an attributive adjective, an adjective that comes before the noun, then we can use separate and then the noun when it comes before. When you use a predicate adjective, one that comes after the verb, like they are separated, then you can use separated as an adjective with ed. So, so this word is used with uh, the verb to be, that's what you're saying? To be separated? Uh-huh. Yes. And in this case, that's not the case. In this case, it's functioning as an adjective, more specifically as an attributive adjective. Right. All right? Yeah. Very good. Number 11. All right. We have Tania Guadalupe's and Montes and Daila Yaratsis. Very good. Why? We have to eliminate the definite article then. Tania, Monse, Daira Yaratsi, Santa Celia, or anybody else. Do you remember because, the rule? Because life is an abstract noun. Because yeah. life is an abstract noun. And we usually don't use uh, articles with abstract nouns. Very good. Number 12. Nothing is missing here. There's something wrong with the word. <coughs> Sorry. We didn't study this in grammar think, class, but you should know this. I think it's during, no? During is the uh, problem. So we need to change that word for what word? And what part of speech mm -hmm. is that? Yeah, what? Yeah, that's a good question. What kind of, what part of the speech is during? It's adverb. Mm -hmm. During is an adverb. adverb. Are you sure? I think. You know, I know. It's a preposition. It's a preposition. So this is the wrong preposition here in sentence number twelve. So let's change that preposition for which one? About? <laughs> no, for. Okay, teacher. For, for, for the preposition for. Why for and not during? Um, sounds similar, but I would use for. But you don't know why? Uh, not exactly. Right okay. now. Back to the store, when do we use during? I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're very thoughtful. Thank I you. I know. <laughs> they were living there during 10 years. During expresses a continuation of time. And four expresses a period of time, which is uh, it's similar, but it's not the same thing, right? So they were living there for 10 years. That means that uh, since this sentence is in past continuous, they don't live there anymore. And if you if we use during, that will be they have been living there. No, let me see. How can we use during? 
You could say like during the uh, actually we during the during World the... War Two during World War Two like during an event, yeah. right? During a, but not really a time frame. Like you would say, I would think of it in terms of like an event during. Yeah. Or um, no, here here is not possible because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you can't use. Like, I can't think of an example during 10 years. I mean, you no. wouldn't use like a period of time. You would say four no, and then a period of so many years or days. Yeah, during refers when something when something is when it, happening or was happening. You could say like during the... Say, mm -hmm. Sorry, you could say during the week, right? Something happens. Yeah. But when you're indicating a number, you typically don't use during the preposition during. The type of preposition that I will be uh, expecting here will be seen since 10 years, right? Uh, but this but four, is, four is good this, too. This participant wrote during, so yeah. no, it doesn't make sense at all. Right? But it, it actually doesn't make sense if we use since all either, I think. No, but four, but four and since are, very, are two common prepositions used. Ah, yeah, in, mistaken, in, yeah in some tenses but during no i mean that's what i'm trying to say you see obviously since would, would also be an error of course right but this person wrote during so i believe that's a literal translation from the spanish to english right but we don't say that in, in english we just use the preposition for Number 13. All right. Um, I think this might be our last one. I want to give you guys time to get into your next, you know, before your next class. It's uh, 9.54. So maybe one more, Luis. Can, can, somebody, can somebody send a message to your, to your uh, what is it, reading teacher? We don't have class, actually. Ah, so when we continue. Thank you. <laughs> Well, there you, you go. Feel, you feel better now, Dr. Stewart? I, I, I feel better now. I feel more at ease. <laughs> <laughs> Number 13, somebody. Sydney had to leave their home. Sydney has to uh, leave their home. Uh -huh. So Tanya Guadalupe okay. wrote, Sydney has to leave her home. So what's the error? Well, she identified two errors. She identified had and she identified there. Tanya Guadalupe, there's only one error. <coughs> Which one, had or there? Yeah, Daira has it. There is the error. Yeah, yeah what's... obviously you need more context to know uh, which one is it, right? Because it could also be had uh, just by looking at this sentence, right? But we're looking here at the the type. What what type of error is this? What's the name of this speech? Speech element. Um. Possessive pronoun. Agreement. Yeah, this is noun, noun pronoun agreement. Right. Sometimes referred to the antecedent, right? The antecedent that comes before, like what the pronoun is representing. Uh -huh. All right. 14. I think that is it. The problem is uh -huh. it. Why uh -huh. it is the problem? Uh, I don't know how to say it, but... Uh... We don't need it, which was about. We don't need it. Does somebody know why we don't need it? <laughs> uh, because it's kind of redundant or repetitive because we actually have which. Um... Very good. In class, in, in grammar class, we studied for uh, uses of the, prep, of the pronoun it, if you remember. Yes. And this is this is none of them. This is another use, well, in this case, wrong use of the pronoun it. And Dr. Stewart just wrote, this is called resumptive, resumptive pronoun, right? That's the name 
uh, that's the name we give to this pronoun in this type of, of, of this type of structures, right? And what does resonative pronoun means? It means when a relative clause where the relative pronoun functions as an object is used, a pronoun that makes reference to the subject of the sentence is not permitted. So why it is not permitted? Well, I think some of you already know that. It is very obvious from this sentence, right? You <coughs> need to identify the subjects and the verbs in each clause. And then uh, by doing that, we know that it is just uh, has no purpose there, right? Did very you good. have a question? Uh -huh. um, I, well, uh, I read that uh, we just use which when we have um, um, like a comma. Um, I don't remember the name of this, but we just uh, use which uh, when uh, there is this situation. Do we need the comma here? Do we need a comma or not? Uh, so basically, what Adam is Adam, <coughs> what Adam Israel is asking is if this if this relative clause or adjective clause is a restrictive or non-restrictive. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody? If we put the comma, would that be a restrictive or non-restrictive relative clause? Uh, no. Restrictive? If we put the comma, that would be non-restrictive. If we don't put the comma, that would be restrictive. So again, is this relative clause essential information or extra information? Mm, it's essential, essential because we, we now to know what was the movie about. So if it is essential, then what is it? Restrictive or non restrictive? Uh, restrictive. Restrictive. So then we don't need then we don't need the comma because we need that information to identify what kind of movie we're talking about. But then can we use which also? Yeah, which is, yeah. which is the subject of the relative clause. That's why we don't need it. The only difference is whether or not you're using the because, comma because or not. if we put it there, then we, we will have double subject. A oh. double subject there. Yeah, because because I, I've read that we can just uh, use, we can use that if we have uh, uh, indistinctly, uh, interchangeably, and which only for uh, res non restrictive. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh -huh. mm. And no, there's he... one more use of uh, which in relative clauses, but that happens when the, the dependent clause is not really a relative clause, the dependent clause modifies the independent clause. We didn't study that either in this first grammar course. The idea is that you learn that in your second grammar course, right? Very good. Did the last one. Uh -huh. uh, for example, it also can be uh, write it like the students enjoy the movie, but <laughs> it was about Mexican history. Like instead of use which, can we use like that. Benjamin, Dr. Stewart, do you have an answer for that? Yeah, you can if it's a, re that is always a restrictive pronoun or restrictive clause. So if you're using that, that's fine. Just don't over, don't use it again, right? So you want to use that was instead of maybe, that it maybe was. Maybe he went for his sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my uh, microphone was was uh, muted. I just gave a great explanation too. <laughs> no, you, um, you yeah, you, you, yeah, no, I heard the question. The um, the the pronoun that you you can use that, but you don't want to use it again as you in your example. You can say that was about right. So that is uh, another relative pronoun, but it's always used for restrictive relative clauses.
So you would never use a you would never use a comma before that as a relative pronoun. Monse's question, Doctor Stor, is if we can replace the word which for the word that. Yes, you can. And the meaning is the same. Yes, it is. Okay. The formality is the same. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I knew that it was correct because like the structure and everything like is still like understanding, but I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, you can use which or that for object for things, but okay. not but not for people. Not for people, okay. right? Yes. The last, the last one, somebody, you're welcome. The pronoun uh, they. They again. Here we have a problem with double subject, right? Girls is is the subject, and if we say they, we're just repeating <coughs> girls, so that's wrong. Okay, next slide. Doctor Doctor Store is going to uh, <coughs> answer your questions about syntactic and lexical errors. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, how can you correct this uh, question? <laughs> what I can do? Uh, it's first what? Uh, what could I do? I do. Mm -hmm. All right, type it. If you can, type it into the chat. So what type, how would you identify this type of error? Mm. How would you label or categorize <laughs> this type of error? <laughs> What do you think? And this is an example of a syntactic error, but what kind of syntactic error is this? I would say a wrong structure question. Okay, so what are you what are you doing when you change what I could do to what could I do? What are you what are you doing there? What are you changing? I change the position of um what could I do? Mm -hmm. We could call uh, this the position of the pronoun of the personal pronoun at next to uh, or after could after the modal verb and and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we could simply just say it's a problem with word order, right? Just the the organization, the word, okay. the order of the words, right? So instead of what I could do, you could say what could I do. Right, and uh, the next one, I working in a restaurant. I think it is, I am, I am working. All right, and what's the type of error? How would you categorize or label this type of error? Mm. Well, the error is in the pronoun. Because uh, when you use like when you put the verb like in present continuous, and if you're talking about the first person, you have to use uh, like the I don't know how to say it, but como la abreviación con el am contraction. Yeah, the contraction. <laughs> we need the auxiliar, the auxiliary verb. Right, we're missing an auxiliary, an auxiliary verb, right? We're, the auxiliary word, which is part of the verb, but more simply, we're just missing a word, right? But it is part, where in this case, where it's actually part of the verb. Okay, very good. The next one, what do you think the, try to correct the error, and then how would you classify this type of error? Uh, they can do it and maybe coma and they can share it. All right, so if you write out, and I'm going to write down what Monty just told me there. They can do it. They can share. Like that? Uh, no, they can share it. Oh, they can. Okay, anyone? Yeah, Tanya, do you have a comment? Uh, yes. It's very 
example, I think it's very repetitivo, el they, they. So we can put it, they can do and share it. All right. All right. Anyone else have an, any ideas about how to correct this sentence? And let me let me give you a hint. Okay, Adan, they can do it. Period. They can share. And then maybe a period after share. Right. So what kind of error is this? What kind of how would you classify this type of mistake or error? Uh, two independent clauses. Two independent clauses. What else? Um, there is a lack of periods. We studied this in class, guys. Right. So you're you're correct, Adan. But we have a name for this. We have a special name that we give this type of error that you just defined. What's the name of this error? <clears throat> oh, it is a uh, comma splice error. Not close. in this example. Close, you're close. It's close, right, but it's not, there's no oh. comma, so there's no comma splice, right? So, then I'll, what is it? A run-on sentence. That's right. It's a run-on yeah. sentence. And run-on sentence is how Adan just defined it. Two main clauses joined together with no connector or no punctuation. So we want to try to avoid this. This is called a run-on sentence because we actually have two sentences up against each other with no connector or no punctuation. Very good. Next one. And this is very related to run-on sentences, but this is a different type of error. Try to fix the error, and then how would you classify or name this type of error? Teacher, what's the abbreviation or? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't quite catch your question. Starts with the sentence starts with Adara. All right, try to fix the sentence and how would you classify the error? Okay, Adan says a daughter became ill, comma, so things were difficult. All right, what how, what would you call this type of error? You fixed it, but what do you mean by in double ill? Uh, ill means sick, like you're sick, you don't feel well, maybe you have a cold. Uh, could it be um, a comma splicer because we have uh, we have the comma but we don't have the correl no, correl the the ordinary conjunction. That's right. We have a comma splice. A comma splice having two main clauses separated by a comma. Right. We could use a connector like you did with so. You could separate it into separate sentences. A lot of different ways to fix it, but yes, that's a comma splice. Next one, sometimes is life. Try to fix the mistake and then label. What would you call this type of mistake? Sometimes it's life. So what, what, uh, what is the mistake? What is the error? How would you classify the error? I'm thinking. Um, well, I, I don't know if I'm if I'm correct, actually. Well, you you are correct. Sometimes it's life. Or sometimes you could use another pronoun. 
uh, that's a little bit more common, I think, than it's, but... That's, like, sometimes that's life? Right, something? you could say, that's what I was thinking. Sometimes that's life. Okay. So what do you think? What what uh, What's the classification? What is the name of the error? Uh, the, in this, in those kind of cases, wouldn't the dummy pronoun uh, it? Um, but what? How would you? What's missing in this sentence? Sometimes is life. What's missing? Uh, the, the personal pronoun it. And it is functioning how in the sentence? We have a verb is. Do we have a subject? Um, we don't have a subject. No, we don't no. have a subject. So, what kind of, what's the name of the error where you're missing either a subject or a verb? My, my brain is kind of yeah. Blast. It's gonna blast now. Sentence fragment. Okay, we call those sentence fragments. Okay. Very good. All right, the last two lexical errors. The first one, their friendship was doing stronger. You fix it, what's wrong with it? Their friendship was getting stronger all right and how would you classify that error mm. i'll give you um, yeah. a wrong birth right so if i give you two choices all right these last two examples they're either a problem with word choice or wrong word. So in this first example, their friendship was doing stronger. Do you think that's a problem with word choice or, or wrong word? Uh, a wrong word. Mm. Does it interfere with the meaning? Oh, no. Not for me. I think I can still kind of understand what's going on. So I think I would call this word choice. The last example, a problem with wrong word. Which word would you change? Or what, how could you change it? Uh, living. I'm sorry? I, I would change living. She was living. Very hard time. She was living a very hard time. Yeah, this one is hard to really distinguish because the the whole meaning is not really clear, and especially in the context of the the essay, it wasn't really clear. So here it could be several. You know, there are different. There are a lot of different ways that you could write this to make it a little bit, um, you know, clear. You could say she was living a difficult, a very difficult time, maybe, but it, she could change it. You know, it just depends on how you would change it. So we cl we cl classified this as being word, uh, just a wrong word, simply because of the meaning was not really clear. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Um, very good. I don't know, Luis, if you have any closing comments. What? What is what is the correction for their friendship was doing stronger? Uh, we need the uh, like the phrasal verb. Adam, uh, Adam Israel wrote was getting stronger. Monte wrote was going stronger. Is this are this okay, Doctor Stewart? Well, uh, her, their friendship was getting stronger. Uh, Adan, I think, has has uh, a good response. Uh, was going stronger? I think I would say getting stronger instead of going stronger. Because in our study, we <clears throat> we when we 
when we rewrote this sentence, we wrote it was growing stronger. Well, yeah, there's there you could say growing or getting. All right, and the second one, she was leaving. Was the correction there? Yeah, I don't I don't remember what how we we corrected okay. it. We corrected this one as she was having. Now, <clears throat> the first one, <clears throat> we identify that type of error as wrong word. And the second one as word choice. Uh, but I've been thinking now that, that we're, the, the students in this, in this class are participating and the explanations that were given to them, that sentences in isolation some sentences, if the error is related to a, lex a lexical error, it is very difficult to know if that error is word choice or word form because yeah. we need more context. context. And as Dr. Stewart just said, uh, even when there's more context, sometimes it is difficult because the information that the writer is providing, the context that the writer is providing for this particular the context might not be very clear. So we just, sometimes we're just uh, guessing. Researchers sometimes they guess which one will be the specific error for that specific structure, for that specific clause, right? So yeah, I agree with Dr. Stewart that sometimes it is hard to identify whether a lexical error can be a word choice error or a wrong word error. The idea again is that a wrong word error is, is when the error interferes with meaning. The meaning of that structure is not clear. And word choice, <clears throat> the error does, doesn't interfere very much with the meaning. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. Right? When, you, when you guys get into the BA, you're gonna take a discourse analysis uh, course and you're gonna be looking uh, in part at writing discourse. And this is what we're talking about is really, uh, it is difficult to take these examples in isolation. You really need to be able to see what's, what is coming before it to get the overall meaning. And then a sentence that by itself might even sound correct could actually be incorrect based on what's coming before it. So, all right, guys, I know we took a little more time. Can you time. Show the references, please? Sure. So this is the end of our presentation or our combination of presentation and workshop. And here you can see some of the references that we used for this study. Obviously, we use more than what? What would you say, Dr. Stewart? Mm. <clears throat> more or less? I don't know, probably... 40, 50? Around 40 or 50, I would say, yeah, easily. Different uh, 40, articles. 50 readings that we did for this study. That's uh, the literature that we that we checked, that we read in order to understand this topic about writing errors that uh, English learners face when they're writing academic paragraphs or academic essays. And then obviously we also read literature about uh, how to identify these errors, how to code these errors, and so on and so on. So this has been a very interesting experience. Uh, this project is ending uh, next month in December this year. And hopefully <clears throat> next year in January, <clears throat> we begin with a new project. We'll be talking about this project uh, later on next year, right? Anything else that you want to say, guys, ladies and gentlemen? Just say thank you because of your time doing this uh, presentation. I really enjoy it because, um, well, I'm not an expert in speaking or writing, and I knew that many things that I thought that, that it were like that it was good uh, they're not and now I know why <laughs> so thank you if we had if we had presented this right at the beginning of the semester <clears throat> I suppose 
some of you will be lost because of all this terminology and all these uh, grammatical uh, aspects of the English language. But after a, almost a semester of grammar and writing and listening and speaking and reading, <clears throat> then I, I know, I'm pretty sure that now you are more aware of how the English language works, right? So it was good that we're, you're, you're the last group <clears throat> that we're presenting this information to. Thank you. Thank you for participating today, for allowing us to give you this uh, presentation workshop today, right? <clears throat> Anybody else? Before we say goodbye. Thank you morning. very much for this. I think it was um, really interesting. Interesting. So thank you very much. Yeah, later on. Well, hopefully, I don't know, Dr. Stuart, can we share with our students the article that was published by Anupi and Copay? Yeah, maybe we can um, we can do that outside of uh, this conversation since we're okay. recording for for evidence. We're recording these sessions, um, but uh, yeah, maybe we can share that article uh, privately in class so that they could see more in detail some of the aspects of our study. I think that would be, if anyone's interested, of course, we can provide that information. Do you, do you want to share that in your class and just explain that this article is based on pre preliminary results for the first year? Sure. All right. Or, or we could uh, share the, the book chapter, although it's not published yet. No, not, not yet, until it is published. All right, so... Um, unless, unless until it is accepted, because we haven't received the confirmation that the, the chapter has been accepted and, it's, and it is taking very, very long. I mean, it's four months already. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the, um, I'll share the Anupi article. Yeah, as soon as the chapter is accepted, then I think we can share that. Uh, we can't do that uh, right now yet, okay? All right, guys, All thank right, you guys. for your attention. Any other no questions problem. or comments? Yeah, teacher, thank you so much. Son bien listillos, Dr. Store. I know. En la clase de grammar van a hacer preguntas. Claro, claro que sí, teacher, ni lo dude. <laughs> enfrentar a dos doctores al mismo tiempo los atemoriza. Ah. Entiendo. Don't, don't be los, laughing, los, teacher. It's not easy. Los, los entiendo, jóvenes. Los entiendo. You're doing fine, enfrentar guys. You're doing fine. Doctor, y luego del tamaño de ese doctor es más fácil. ¿Eh? <laughs> enfrentar a un doctor de 1.60 metros es más fácil. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we'll let you go, and um, we'll see you. See you guys. Well, and me, for my case, we'll see you guys tomorrow, and you'll see Dr. Lucenberto a little bit later. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. We'll Thank see you, you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, teacher. Thank, Thank you, too. Thank you. I'll, I'll see you, you. At, at 11 o'clock. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. See you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>